Y'all, I wanted to share this with you. I am so excited to share this with you. I am so excited to share this with you. Christ is not Jesus's last name. I have some, I, I, we're going to talk tonight. We're going we're gonna to talk tonight. <clears throat> Let me preface it with the intention that when I finish talking today, you're never going to see the scriptures the same. That you're going to see your true identity in God, which is Christ. And that you're going to begin to operate at a higher level. What I'm going to share with you is not the result of one night's inspiration. It's not one sermon I heard. It's not one thought I had and say, oh, let me get on here and say this. This has been years of study. And this has been revelations that have been unraveling to me over time. And when I, I really shouldn't even say me. This, this is something that the Holy Spirit has poured out over the earth really since the beginning of time. It's just that it's gotten masked. And we're going to unmask some things. That's what revelation means. I know, know y'all think of it as a bad thing. Revelation means to reveal. That's what apocalypse means. To unveil. So we're going to unveil some things. Because remember, I didn't even know I was going to go here. We're just going to flow today. The scripture tells us in 2 Corinthians, excuse me, chapter 4, verse 8. I think it starts maybe at 7. That if our gospel is veiled, it's not, by the way. But that's my words. But it's not. The scriptures where the scripture says, if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled because the God of this world has, has blinded the mind of the unbeliever. So we're going to, we're going to unveil some things today. Now, now, now this is what I've got to ask you. I've got to ask you this as we go through this journey. And you know, I don't always go through scripture. You know, sometimes I just have a motivational word. And I'm just talking through it. I got a lot of scripture to give today. It is no way that I could talk about something like this and not give a tremendous amount of scripture because some of it is going to smack in the face of your theology. It is. It's going to smack in the face of your religion. <laughs> Sorry. By the way, Jesus didn't belong to a religious group, but <laughs> I don't want to I don't want to touch that. <laughs> the only time you saw Jesus Dealing with a religious group, they were debating with him. They were trying to argue with him. They were trying to trip him up. And ultimately, they were responsible for his arrest. All right. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus this, what I'm sharing with you is are the words of Jesus and the words of our Christ. But I've got I've got I've got scripture that I've got to give you because we've got to begin to move to a higher level. I think it was Paul who said, you know, you, we were babes and we drunk milk. But there has come a time. And it, there, there has come a time where we've got to get off milk. Excuse me, I think that's in Hebrews. And we've got to go to solid food. This is solid food. This is solid food. Now, this is what I'm going to ask you. I'm going to ask you, to, this is why I'm going to give you the scriptures, to search the scriptures for yourself. Don't just don't just say, well, I don't know about this minister and go away. No, stick with me. Hear the word. Let it let it ruminate in your spirit and then search the scriptures for yourself. And I'm accessible. You can DM me if you think I got it wrong or if I, it's a scripture I said out of place. Please share that with me. I, I am always studying, learning, growing and developing because we know in part and we prophesy in part. Some of us have more parts. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we just gonna have fun tonight. But some of us do have more parts because the scripture says, ask and it will be answered. Seek and you'll find. Not everybody's seeking, not to the same extent. And let me tell you, let me tell you, oh, boy, I got a lot to say, but we don't, I don't want to. <sighs> Holy Spirit. Have your way, frame my thoughts. Let your message be taught tonight with simplicity and let it loose people, deliver people, transform people, inspire people. I know this is why I've been under such tremendous attack because the enemy is scared that this message is gonna get out and the message is already out. <laughs> so all I'm doing is echoing 
the words of our Christ that have been in the earth since the beginning of time. And it will be done. In Jesus' name, I pray this thing. Amen. Um, I want to start with this by saying that if you have followed my journey for any amount of time, you know that I was raised in the church, which is a wonderful thing. Um, so I, I don't take lightly when I am confronted with things that challenge my belief system. Some of what I'm going to share with you tonight are things that I outright rejected. Outright rejected it. So y'all going to give me grace for those of you that may have shared this with me years ago. And I might have thrown a four letter word at you. Because don't you, don't you come up against my religion. But God has a way of dog walking you. <laughs> so I'm just put it like that. Honestly, God has a way of putting you through circumstances and situations to help you to see uh, you don't know everything you think you know. And secondly, if you knew everything you thought you knew, you'd be living with more power. That's where I want to start. And this is a moment of self-reflection. I want you to ask yourself. For those of you that may be listening and you've been in God for years, decades. And, and, and for some of you, you know, you'll argue over the scriptures and you'll debate over the scriptures and you'll fight over the scriptures and you, you swear. I know the scripture says don't swear on anything, but you really do. You swear you got it together. You, matter of fact, somebody starts telling the story, you tell the rest of the Bible story, you, you just know the interpretation. But if that's the case, why are you not having the outcomes that you desire? Why are you not living with the level of power that Jesus lived with? If you know as much as you say you know. And so for me, the rediscovery of God on a higher level was the humility to say, my life shows that I'm not as smart as my mouth mate want it to look like. Let me say it a different way. That I, I, if, I, if I knew everything that I say that I know, then I would be walking in a higher dimension. And so, you know, the way high in the kingdom is low. I'm telling you, the way high is low. Isn't there a scripture that says, humble yourself under the, humble yourself under the, humble yourself under the mighty hand of God and he will exalt you? So I want to, this is, tonight isn't to be provocative. This isn't what this is about. This isn't about, I'm not, I'm not one of those type people. Some people, they just throw something out to be provocative to get clicks and likes and get people to turn their head. No, 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 no. This isn't about that. I'm not being provocative for provocative sake, but some of the things I'm going to say is going to challenge your belief system. I'm telling you it is. I'm telling, I'm giving you a fair, you know, spoiler alert, trigger warning. But this is what I said. If you are able to listen here with an open mind, listen to me, with an open mind and ask the Holy Spirit to show you in your life how it applies to you. I promise you, you're going to walk out of this teaching on a higher level. It's one of the Greek philosophers that said the sign of a brilliant mind is to be able to think a thought without accepting it. You see, never be so afraid of the answer that you don't ask the question. In fact, in Peter, we're told, you have to be ready to give a reason for the hope that's in you. I understand we, we, we just, I'm, I'm prefacing it before I even go into it because I need you to, I need to, I need to till the ground here. I understand we're so quick to say, just trust God and just have faith. Just, yeah, these are little short answers. But a lot of times we say that because we don't really, we haven't really uncovered for ourselves. And so we're threatened by the question. So we throw it off by saying, just have more faith. But I'm, I'm telling you that we're entering into a time of, of deep, uh, we're entering into a time of deep deception. I mean, you can watch a video now and realize it's not even the person, it's AI. You got to know what the Holy Spirit is saying. You got to have a spirit of discernment. And if you are scared of a question, if you're scared of someone coming, 
against your theological framework for 20 minutes or 30 minutes, you're not going to you're not going to make it into the day and age that we're going into. So 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 I just I wanted to till the ground there. Tonight we're going to talk about the fact of we're going to talk about what does Christ mean? Christ is not Jesus's last name. And I know you've probably heard that before. Christ is in Jesus' last name. But I need to tease this out further because I need you to understand. I'm going to give you the end from the beginning right now, just like our Lord would do. I'm going to declare the end from the beginning. This is where I'm going. Christ is your nature. All of us are called to be Christ. I just, I'm, going to, I'm going to just start there because this is where we're going. And I'm not going to say that by the end of tonight, we're going to arrive there. Just stick with me over the next few days and weeks and I'm going to unravel this teaching to you. But this is where I'm going. I'm not stopping at the fact that Christ is in Jesus' last name. It's his nature. But I'm also moving to the fact that this is also our nature. All right. So this is where I want to start. I want to start in the book of Colossians. I want to go to chapter one, 27. I'm, I'm not. I'm, I, I take it that if you watch me, lady, you can pause it. And you can get there on your own. And I want you to get there on your own. And as time comes and my wealth builds and I have world class studios, I'll be able to have the scripture pulled up as I'm speaking. But right now, just pretend it's up on the screen. All right. Chapter one. Uh, excuse me. It's Colossians chapter one, verse 27. All right. Um, I want to start in 25. This is Paul writing to the church at Colossus. If I had time, I would talk about Colossus, but I don't want to turn this into a history lesson. Whereof I have been, I have made a minister according to the dispensation of God, which is given to me for you to fulfill the word of God. Even the mystery, underline that mystery, circle that mystery, highlight it, which hath been hid, hid from ages and from generations, but is now made manifest to his saints. Hold on. I'm, before we even get to 27, look at what he's saying. Paul, I, Paul is saying precisely what I said earlier about the unveiling, the revealing, the uncovering, the apocalyptic, that there is something that has been hid. There has been a mystery. There's been a riddle. It's been something cryptic that's been set in the past that is now being revealed. What is being revealed? Let's go to 27. To whom God would make known what is the mystery, excuse me, what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Christ in you, the hope of glory. We're going to circle around those words like a good pilot waiting for clearance to land would circle around the airport. And we're going to circle around that for the next few weeks. We're going to circle around that. I'm going to give you much scripture. I'm going to give you much to look at, but we're going to keep circling around that. That's our foundational scripture. That's what I want you to ruminate on. Christ in you, the hope of glory. Let the Holy Spirit reveal it to you. Christ in you, the hope of glory. Christ in you, the hope of glory. Christ in you, the hope of glory. Let's take it back. Remember when you were younger and they would say, you want to accept Jesus into your heart? And it was nice to say, but it wasn't Jesus that you're accepting into your heart. It's Christ. <laughs> I'm going to get there. I'm going to get there. But I was confused when I was younger. I really was because I'm like, okay, let me understand this. Now, I, I, because I'm not just in Sunday school, I'm sitting in the main messages. Jesus died, was crucified, buried, rose again, walked the earth for 40 days, and then ascended into the Father. So how's he in my heart? No, no, I, I would wonder that. Then we read, that Jesus is at the right hand of the Father. Because then I'm wondering, well, maybe he went up to the Father, had a conversation, and he's in our heart. I understand he can be in many people's hearts. So that it wasn't the, the heart. It was the location. So then I'm told, and Scripture reminds us, that he's sitting at the right. Let me take you there. 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 Okay. I want to go... I want to go to, I want to go to Romans 8. 
And you'll forgive me because I don't have everything queued up. Like I said, that will come soon when I have an entire staff to help me with this. I'm in Romans 8.34. Because I, I, I just want to, I, I want, you know, I, I want to make sure we're on the same page. Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather, that is risen again, who is at the right hand of God, who makes intercession for us. This is good. This is good. Because keep in mind, we're talking about Jesus, but there are times where Jesus and Christ are used interchangeably. And I'll come back to that. It's because Jesus was so in tune with his Christ nature. You see that there are times when he's called Christ, but we're talking about Jesus. Okay, let's go further. Who's going to separate us from the love of Christ? Tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword. I'm still in Romans. As it is written, for thy sake we are killed all day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things to come, present, nor height, nor death, nor any creature is able to separate us from the love of our God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Christ Jesus our Lord. Christ Jesus our Lord. We're going to talk about Christ Jesus and Lord. I don't know if we're going to get to all that tonight, but we need to break this down. Christ in you, the hope of glory. So which one is it? Is Christ in you? Is Christ at the right hand of the Father? Is Christ in the earth? Before I answer that, Let's talk about where the word Christ comes from. Christ is a Greek word. Christ is a Greek word. And Christ is a Greek word. Excuse me. Which comes from where we say Messiah. Christ meaning Christos. Christos is the Greek word, but Messiah is the Hebrew word. So I'm, I'm taking you back. We need to reverse engineer this. Messiah is a Hebrew word, which means the anointed one. All right? The anointed one. Even though Messiah is a Hebrew word, the root of it is Egyptian. So Pharaoh, the, the Pharaohs, when they were anointed, and Pharaoh means great house, by the way, but the Pharaohs in Egypt, when they were anointed, they were anointed using the fat of crocodile. It was an oil that came from the fat of crocodiles. The reason is because they worshipped one of these gods that they believed like was a crocodile, had a crocodile head. Okay. The oil, the God itself, and the ceremony of anointing all were named Mensa. I'm giving you the root word for Messiah. So Messiah was about anointing. It was originally a pagan term. And the reason why I said it was, you know, different uh, historians say different things. Some people say it was the name of the God that they were worshiping. Some say it was the name of the uh, uh, the the uh, ointment itself, the, the, the ointment that came from the fat of the crocodile. Others say it was actually the name of the ceremony where the Pharaoh was anointed. The point is the Hebrews who you know had been 430 years enslaved in, in Egypt, so this is not a surprise that they would take a turn from the Egyptians, they were used to hearing about the anointed one, anointing. They're, you didn't come to the throne without being anointed. It wasn't just about being born. I'm, go, I'm going somewhere. 
Trust me, I'm going somewhere. It wasn't just about being born. It was about being anointed. You weren't born on the throne. You were born to rule, but you had to be anointed to reign. <laughs> I'm going somewhere. And so the Hebrews sort of uh, appropriated the term. And so because the Hebrews believed that there was one who would come, who would deliver them. I'm not talking Moses now. Moses was a foreshadowing of Jesus. They were waiting for the one who would deliver them. They were waiting on the Messiah. Now, let me step back for a second. If you read certain translations of scriptures, there are some which call Cyrus a Messiah. You remember Cyrus, who was a pagan king, who released the children of Israel or helped the children of Israel rebuild? Because Messiah just meant anointed one. Now, as time went on, it turned into Messiah being one person. But Messiah, like Christ, was about anointing. Messiah, like Christ, was about an, a, 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 it was a spiritual identity. I'm trying, I'm, I'm getting, I'm, I'm coming somewhere. It was a spiritual identity. Yes, it rested on people, but it was not exclusive to a person. That was the term. I'm not talking about the Bible. Now. I'm talking about the term because I need you to understand how the term came into common usage. I need you to understand what you're saying when you say Christ. You're talking about an anointed one. You're talking about anointing. You're talking about one who was sent. You're talking about one of assignment. You're talking about a, a you're talking about someone in a different dimension. You're, you're walking on earth, but a different dimension. <clears throat> So when, when, when we're told that Christ is in you, Christ is in you, Christ is in you, what are we really saying? That was the mystery. Christ in you. <laughs> okay, okay. Let's set that on the shelf. Let me come at it a different way. Do you notice... When the, the scripture comes, and forgive me if I'm wrong here, I think it came to Joseph. The word came to Joseph and said, you're going to call his name Jesus. Talking about the baby of Mary, you're going to call his name Jesus. And then at another point, it, he's told uh, his name is going to be Emmanuel. God is with us. Do you notice the name was never given as Christ? Pause. Let's go here. Because I see, I see, I feel in my spirit people are looking at me crazy. Give me a second, y'all. Say that, my. Uh, let's go to Matthew. Let's go to Matthew. Let's go to Matthew. Let's go to Matthew. We're going to go to the first verse, first chapter of Matthew. <clears throat> We're in the 21st verse, first chapter, Matthew. Let's go to 20. But while he thought on these things, who's he, Joseph? Behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream. Hmm. Saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived of her is of the Holy Ghost. And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus. Jesus. For he shall save his people from their sins. Now, this was all done. And it might be fulfilled, which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Behold, a virgin shall be with child and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which interpreted is God with us. You see where we're going here? Jesus, Emmanuel, never mentioned Christ. 
Then Joseph, being raised from the sleep, did as the angel of the Lord had bid him, bidden him and took unto him his wife and knew her not. So she had brought forth her firstborn son and he called his name Jesus. The reason why you aren't hearing Christ brought up here is because Christ was not a part of Jesus's name. It was his nature. It was his nature and it's your nature. Oh, I'm, uh, trust me, I'm about to get you there. It's your nature. It's your nature. Now, let me bring you to a scripture that people have a, people, People give me how they, they will, Jesus will say one thing and then they'll, they'll dumb it down. They'll walk it back. Let's go to John chapter 14. Y'all know I love John. Chapter 14, verse nine. Jesus saith unto them, have I been? Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Let's start with eight. <laughs> Let's start at one. I mean, it's so much to read. Let's start at eight. Philip said unto him, Lord, show us the Father, and it sufficeth us. And Jesus said, Have I been so long with you, and yet thou hast not known me, Philip? He that hath seen me hath seen the Father. And how sayest thou then, Show us the Father? Believe thou that I am in the Father, and the Father in me, and that the words I speak to you, I speak not of myself, but the Father that dwelleth in me, he doeth the works. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father in me, or else believe me for the work's sake. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me the works that I do, he shall also do, and greater works than, than these shall he do, because I'm in the Father. Why can't we just accept that we're going to do greater works than Jesus? I people say, I've heard people say, well, what he meant was... What he, let me get me what he meant. What he meant was that we'll do, we'll, we'll, we'll reach more people. Cause like there's the internet. So we can reach more people than Jesus ever reached. But, but we, we're not going to do greater works. Greater works doesn't mean greater than. <laughs> y'all gonna, y'all gonna, y'all gonna get a rare side of me tonight. Cause I got a lot to say, but I'm, tr I gotta, I gotta get it there. I gotta get it there. At no point did he say you're going to be greater than me. He said, you'll do greater works than me. So why does that threaten people? Let me tell you something else that threatens people. That threatens people. Let's go to the word. I'm going to give you scripture tonight. I'm going to give you scripture tonight. I'm going to give you scripture tonight. I want to give you scripture tonight. Because, because what I don't want you to do is to be unaware. What I don't want you to do is to be in a place where you're trying to figure out what's true and what's not. So we're coming back, of course, to John. And we're in 10. Let's go to 33. No, 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 no. Mm. I want to go to I want to go to 30. I and my father are one. Just pause on that for a second. Just pause. Just pause for a second. Let's, let's, let's just pause on that. Let's let the Holy Spirit do some speaking right now. Give me, give me, give me 10 seconds. I and my father are one. Okay, let's just say, let's just say, let's just say, I'm just going to give you an instance. Let's say, I walked up to you and I said, me and my father are one. Tell me my natural father, we're just alike. Does that statement mean that others cannot be one with my father as well? No. You can read into it that if you want. What if 
just like the firstborn of all creation, which the word says he is. Oh, 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 keep your finger there. Keep your finger there. Let's go back to Colossians. Let's go back to Colossians. I'm going to give you word tonight. I'm going to give you word tonight. This isn't, this isn't Daryl's opinion. I'm in chapter one again. I'm in chapter one again. I'm in chapter one of Colossians. Let's go to 15. Let's go to 15. Who is the image of the invisible God? We're talking about, hold on, hold on. I don't want to tell you who we're talking about. Let's take it back. Where are we at? Boy, well, if we go, this is, uh, because I, I want you to know where we at, where we're, what we're doing. Let's go to 12. Giving thanks unto the Father, which has made us to, to made us meet to be partakers into the, in the, in the inheritance of the saints in light, who have delivered us from the power of darkness and have translated us into the kingdom of his dear son, whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. Who, we're talking about his son now. We're talking about Jesus now, who is the image of the invisible God. Thank you, Holy Spirit. The firstborn of every creation. And by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in the earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities, all things were created by him and for him. And he is before all things and by him all things consist. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn. He keeps talking about the firstborn, not the only born. Huh? That in all things we, we might have preeminence. For it pleased the Father that in him should all the fullness dwell. So he's the firstborn, not the only born. Stay there. I want to go to John again. I want to I want to go back to John. Okay. Jesus says at that day, we're in John 14, 20. At that day, you shall know that I am in my father and you're in me and I'm in you. I need you to, I need you to get this. Okay, so even if you stop at, well, he and his father had a special relationship that none of us could have, which is not true. But let's say you believe that. Jesus is telling you, he's telling you in so many different ways, I'm in the father, you're in me and I'm in you. Huh? This is what Christ is telling us. He's telling us this from his Christ nature. <laughs> I'm in you. You're in me. This is the Christ consciousness. I, I know I never said that before, but I'm giving you a different way of looking at it. This is Christ consciousness. Jesus was so conscious of his Christhood. That his nature became fused with his name. But it, it wasn't as if Jesus was the only Christ. And I don't say this to bring Jesus down because I don't want you to be offended. I really don't want you to be offended. I want you to be transformed. I do this to bring you up. Let me tell you what else Jesus said. Let's go back to 10. I, I stopped that I and my father are one, but we're in 10 verse 30. Then the Jews took up stones again to stone him. <laughs> again. Because they said, now you, you're gone, you know, you're gone too far. And Jesus answered them and said, many good works have I showed you from my father. For which of these works do you stone me? And the Jews answered them saying, for a good work we stone thee not, but for blasphemy. Because thou being a man, maketh thyself God. Hold on, hold on. I'm going somewhere. That's a strong statement. Who are you as man to make yourself God? They knew what he was saying when he said, I'm the, I'm the son. It was the same thing. Who are you to, who are you to do this? 
like I okay. Footnote, but it it it's it's a story that's a part of what's happening here. It makes sense. Y'all know that I have friends in Pakistan. And part of the reason why it's it's taken a while for some of the brand that I've created to come out is because it took about two weeks. One of the young men says to me, look, I didn't want to tell you this, but I'm having a hard time here in Pakistan because most of the printers are Muslim and they won't print your shirt. So well, what's wrong with my shirt? My shirt says overcomer, God's son. And he tells me they won't print it because they say this is blasphemy. You can't be God's son. <laughs> so, you know, I sort of laughed at it because I said, yeah, I mean, I get it. When you're in a country where there's really not a separation of church and state, right? You have this issue. And I said, just tell them to take out the God's son. We'll do that part when it comes to America. Just put overcomer. This sort of battle is still going on. Who are you as man to make yourself like a God? This is Jesus' response. This is Jesus' response. And I'm going to tell you something. You can sit in church for 30 years. I'm telling you, I sat in church. In some cases, when I was growing up, we didn't just go on Sunday twice because we went twice on Sundays. We went midweek service and sometimes they have a Friday service. They have a revival. I would say by the time I was 18 years old, I probably, what if it's 52 weeks in a year? Let's say I missed a couple weeks, right? Which I can't remember really ever happening. You go twice a week, that's 100. 100 times 18, I had at least heard 3,000 sermons. Easy. Not one person have I ever heard preach on John. That's been falling. Preach on John 10, 34. Not one. I'm not saying it doesn't happen now. I know somebody will get mad and say, well, wait a minute, somebody mentioned. I never heard it preached on. So much so. That when it was brought to my attention in my 20s, I almost got into a physical altercation with somebody because I told them, how dare you say that Jesus said that? I ain't never heard that. And then I had to eat humble pie when I realized Jesus really had said this. Is it not written in your law? This is what Jesus says. I said, ye are gods. He's quoting David, by the way. If he called them gods unto whom the word of God came and the scripture cannot be broken, say ye of him whom the father has sanctified and sent into the world, thou blasphemous, because I said I'm the son of God? Step back with me. Step back with me. If you've been, if you've been following me up to this point, I want to congratulate you because some people wouldn't get this far. Because this is going to challenge some things. This is what I want to ask. For just let's lay aside everything I've said for a second. I just want to ask you this question. Why do you think that's not preached? No, no, no. No, 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 no. I'm not being critical of people who preach well. Because the bottom line is God tells people to preach what they preach. And that's their ministry. It's maybe not their ministry. But I'm just asking you, why is this not being preached? Why is it not being preached? They'll preach to you all day, every day. There's no good in you. And there's nothing good in you. And you were shaped in sin. And you were formed in iniquity. And you're going to hell if you don't know Jesus. But why don't they say you're gods? Jesus said that. Ask yourself this question. Why is it that the institution of religion denies your godhood. Oh, okay. That's a strong word. I'm not going to say denies your godhood. Doesn't teach it to you. I'm not saying that there haven't been certain pastors and ministers that are teaching this word. I'm talking about the institution of religion. The institution of religion has not taught you about your godhood. They have not. If they have, why don't they talk this scripture that Jesus said as much as they talk about uh, that, that there's supposedly no good in you and that you're born destined to go to hell? That's what people say. They preach this stuff and they call it the good news. <laughs> That'd be the part that gets me. What's good news about that? When Jesus himself said, suffer the little children to come to me because their angels always see the face of God. So how does, okay, square what Jesus said there with you saying you're born on the way to hell. That's what people will say this. There's nothing good in you. That 
it's a let me be careful how I say this because I don't want to use strong words. Let me say it this way. That is not a teaching that is in line with Christ. That is not the words of Christ. That's not the words of Christ. Now you have to have training to come into your inheritance. Absolutely. Does it? Does this make you? Does this make you feel better? So that it doesn't seem like. So what are you saying, minister? We're on the same level as Jesus. Well, what I am saying is that you have the same nature as Jesus. Let's start there. Jesus was sent. You were sent. I mean, you don't think you originated here, right? Even Paul said your citizenship is in heaven. So I am saying you have the same nature of G as Jesus, but clearly you are not operating on the same level as Jesus because you don't have the same awareness as Jesus. I said it before, I'm going to say it again. So we're clear on this. Jesus was so in line and aware of his Christhood that people can't even separate the difference between Jesus and Christ. They just say Jesus Christ. Even people that don't necessarily believe in him would say Jesus Christ because that was, that was he so embraced his nature that he was the perfect outpicturing of Christ on earth. So you have the tendency to walk away with it by saying, well, only that was Christ. No, that's why I said greater works than I, you'll do. He was trying to tell you the whole way, everything I can do, you can do. Remember, remember what, oh, I'm going to take you there. Hold on. I'm going to take you there. I'm going to take you there. Let's go to Mark. Let's, let's go to Mark. Let's go to Mark. Um... I, 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 it's in Matthew 2, but I, I really want to do it in Mark. Let's go to Mark chapter 4. I hope this is blessing somebody. Mark 4, 37. And there arose a great storm of wind, and the waves beat into the ship, so that it is now full. And he was in the hinder part of the ship, asleep on a pillow. And they said, and they awake him and said unto him, Master, carest not that we perish? And he arose and rebuked the wind and said unto the sea, Peace be still. And the wind ceased. And there was a great calm. And he said unto them, Why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? And they feared exceedingly and said to one another, This is what I needed to get to. They said to one another, What matter of man is this? That even the wind and sea obey. He was man. Oh, he was divine too. People say 100% God, 100% divine, 100% man. And I, I almost say this at the, oh, Holy Spirit, should I go here now? Because I don't want to lose people now. But I'm going to go ahead and say it because it's on the tip of my tongue. You are also 100% man and 100% divine. You have the same nature as Jesus. It's just that Jesus was much more aware of it. That's why he came. He came to show you how to walk in the duality of man and God, of spirit and flesh. He didn't just come to show you a movie. When I say show you a movie, to do something, right? I know people say, well, he just came to die and go to the cross. But the scripture says that he, the lamb was slain before the foundations of the world. So if the lamb was slain before the foundations of the world, what was Jesus going on the cross about? <laughs> I told you, I told you I'm going to confront some things today. If the lamb was slain before the foundations of the world, okay, because Jesus going to the cross was not before the foundations of the world. Am I right or am I wrong? This comes after Abraham, it comes after Moses, it comes after Enoch, was called up into heaven, it calls up, come after Elisha, it comes after Joseph, it comes after the children of Israel when slavery came out, built the temple, went back into bondage, came out, built the second temple, went into another period of bondage. So, so what's happening here? Maybe it was because Jesus came to outpicture the perfect walk of spirit and flesh. Knowing that that's what you are. That's the mystery. That Christ is in you. Just as it was in Jesus. It's a Christ consciousness. So when Jesus is saying. 
I'm in the Father and the Father's in you. Excuse me, I'm in the Father and I'm in you and you're in me. It, it's, it's a revelation. It's an unveiling of this Christ consciousness, this Christ consciousness that, that the spirit of Christ is in all man. Oh, wait a minute. Wait a minute, minister. Are you telling me, are you telling me that it's in people that aren't saved? Well, we need to talk about what saved is. <laughs> okay. If you mean saved going at creating a, you know, an altar call. And one day, not today, we're going to talk about that. The altar call came about in like the 1850s in America because it was like a marketing ploy, right? So and I'm not against it, right? Because it's brought people to Christ. But I need you to understand that more people have come into salvation and never did an altar call, as it were. So let's be clear on that. When we're talking about salvation, we're talking less about one act at one time, at one point, in one season, in one moment of your life. And we're talking more about a full transformation of mind, body, spirit, soul, thinking, and paradigm. That right there, if you just ruminate on what I just said right there, that'll keep you up all night. Because salvation is a, it's a process, it's not an act. I'm not going to touch that now. I'm not going to touch that now because that's going to take us somewhere else. And, I, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get to that later. Let me come back over to we're talking about Christ consciousness. We're talking about Christ in all. Oh, let's go back. Let's go back. I feel some resistance. I feel some resistance. I feel some resistance because people are saying, are you saying you don't have to get saved? That's not what I said. Are you saying that Jesus isn't the way, the truth, and the life? That isn't what I said. Are you saying that anybody can go to heaven? I didn't even talk about heaven. Are you saying that everybody has Christ, whether they got saved or not? <laughs> Are you saying that everybody's image is the image of God, regardless of not if they're aware of it or not? That's what I'm saying. Your image is your image, even if you're not aware of it. Then, because you're not aware of it, because you made decisions to divorce yourself from it, there are consequences to that. That's not this message. That'll be another message. Absolutely, there are consequences to that. We're not robots on a string where everything just is potted out for us on a course and it's just going to happen regardless of our decisions. Yes, you have, decision, you have decisions, you'll have consequences. There's no question about that. But I, what I want to disabuse you of is the fact that your nature is any different than any other man's, which is Christ. The question is, have you leaned into that nature so you can outpicture it? Because I can be the son of a billionaire, but if I don't know how to access the father, then I can live like a pauper. But it doesn't change the fact that I am the son. The prodigal son was a son when he was prodigal. Think on that for a second. I want to bring you, 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 I want to bring you back to Genesis. As my my uh, my Dominican friends call it, Hennessy. I remember the first time I heard that in the church. They said, Hennessy. I said, Praise God. They said, Oh no, we're talking about Genesis. I said, Oh, okay. You said Hennessy. <laughs> I'm in Genesis chapter one, excuse me, chapter four, verse 25. And Adam, Adam. And Adam knew his wife again, and she bare a son and called his name Seth. For God said, she hath appointed me another seed in the stead of Abel, whom Cain slew. And to Seth, to him, there was also born a son. You see in the lineage? And he called his name Enos. And then men began to call upon the name of the Lord. I want you to get this. I'm really reading this so we get to 26B. Then men began to call on the name of the Lord. From the very first family, it's taking you from Adam to Seth to Enos. From the very first family, people were calling on the name of the Lord. Why? Because the, the, the nature of Christ is written on the hearts of man. Even if they don't know what to call it, even if they're running away from it, even if they disabuse themselves, even if they try to say, I want nothing to do with it. The nature is the nature. 
away with this teaching that would have you to believe that somehow you are, uh, when you confess something, that now you are, uh, I want to be careful I say this, it's not that you don't have a better nature. When you confess it, you what, what's happening is you're becoming aware of the finished work. You're becoming aware of the finished work, but away with this teaching that you're somehow better than the next man. Because what? You came into an awareness of something that all men have? How would you treat people of other faiths if you really believe they were in the image of God? See, that's part of my issue with the way that some of the things are taught in religion. It's almost as if people feel like they have a monopoly on God. And it's not just a Christian thing. I've seen it with Muslims. I've seen it with Muslims. I've seen it with uh, people who are, they, you know, they call themselves, you know, Coptic or Christians or Jehovah Witnesses or Scientology, Church of Latter-day Saints, not Scientologists, they, they're doing something different. <laughs> no disrespect. Uh, they don't even believe in a God, as it were, like that. But it, it, it boggles my mind how people who, I mean, you, you're in one region of the world in one section and you think you have a monopoly on the all-seeing, all-knowing, all-wise God? Let me take you to Hebrews. I told you we're going to be heavy in scripture tonight. Let me take you to Hebrews. Because I don't want you to think this teaching is, is, is hanging on a string from one scripture. God, Hebrews 1, chapter 1, who at sundry times, sundry, 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 that means various times, in diverse manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed heir of all things by whom also he made the worlds. God who at sundry times in diverse planners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets. Who are the fathers? Who are the prophets? You think it's just in one country? You think it's just in one region? I mean, honestly, let's, let's be honest for a second. I've heard people say, between the Old Testament and the New Testament, God didn't speak for 400 years. Do you really believe that? Or do you think he didn't speak to Israel for 400 years? <laughs> do you really think in all of the earth that God did not speak or utter a word to any person on the face of the earth for 400 years? Do you believe that the Bible, this is the difference between the Bible and the word, by the way. The Bible will lead you to the word, but you can know the Bible and not know the word. Okay, do you think that the Bible is the full historiography of all that God did? John himself said, if I were to talk about everything Jesus did, we're not even talking about the Father, that Jesus did, I, I suppose all the books in the world, all the world couldn't contain all the books. I'm trying to, I'm, what I'm trying to do is slow walk you to the place where you see all men in the image of God. It's going to make you a much more better witness. I can promise you that. It's hard to witness the people you're secretly judging. It's hard to witness the people you think are going to hell anyway because of the way they were born or who they worship or how they worship. Could it be, hold on, could it be that they have an understanding of Christ consciousness? Go with me. Don't get mad at me. Don't block me. Not yet. Listen to this. Could it be that they have an understanding of Christ consciousness from a different viewpoint than you? <laughs> hold, hold on, hold on. I got something for you. I got something for you. We're going back to John. I got something for you. Uh, I believe... Uh, I, I, I want to go to... I want to go to John 10. Oh, I want to go to John 10. This is, this is, this is, this is, this is going to bless you. This is Jesus again. I love Jesus. I really do. And I love his words. Jesus was a lot more plain than people who try to interpret it. That's why I just want to read his words. Okay. Um, you know this scripture because let's start at 1, 10, 1. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that entereth not by the door, uh, uh, but into the sheepfold, but climbeth up some of, excuse me, let me say it right. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that entereth not by the door into the sheepfold, but climbeth up uh, some other way, the same as a thief or a robber, but he that entereth in by the door is a shepherd of sheep. Okay, which this is a shepherd of the sheep parable. I guarantee you've heard this many times, but this is the part. I guarantee you haven't heard hurt said much. And if it was read, they read and glossed over it, but you haven't heard it preach much. 
I am the good shepherd. Hold on. Where am I at? I'm in verse 14, 10, 14. Are you ready for this? Strap your seatbelts on. This is Jesus' words. I am the good shepherd and I know my sheep and I am known of mine. As the father knoweth me, even so I know the father. And I lay down my life for my sheep. Hold on. Are you with me? Are you ready for this? And other sheep I have, which are not of this fold. Them also must I bring, and they shall hear my voice, and there shall be one fold and one shepherd. I told you tonight, tonight we're gonna we're gonna talk about some things. This is a second scripture that you don't hear talked about much. If you thought, yeah, gods don't get preached much about, this one really confuses people. What is Jesus talking about? What do you mean, Jesus? There's other sheep in another fold. There's another fold. You're not the only one. I know you thought you were. I know you thought. I know you thought you were. I know you thought the way you worship, the way you talk, the way you got your churchisms, you're the only one that knows God. And you go out Bible bashing people and preaching people into hell. And the scripture says there's sheep of another fold. They're still mine. They're still mine. How would you preach to people if you knew that there was another fold and you don't even know what the other fold is? That's how cryptic Jesus was about it. I'm not even going to break that down. Just know they're not in this fold. Just know they don't talk like you. They don't act like you. They don't relate to me like you. <laughs> but it doesn't mean that I don't know them and they don't know me. So when I'm traveling the world, see, this is why I think it's a beautiful thing. When you travel the world and you open your mind and you start having experiences with different people and different places and different things and different spaces. And it, it challenges the locality of how you made God. Because you tried to make God in, in your image rather than you being in his image. So you think if people don't come into the fold the way you think they should come into the fold, then they don't know Jesus. They don't know Christ. And here Jesus is saying, I got, I got, trust me, I got this. And I got sheep that's in another fold. Oh, they will be one fold. You're going you're gonna, to you're gonna see in the end time, there's a lot of people that you preach them to hell that you, you and we, we respect you because you didn't know. You didn't know. You were judgmental about something that wasn't even your place. Because the Bible says anyway, it's the, it's the goodness of God that brings people to repentance. So you're trying to scare the hell out of people. I don't know what that, how that's going to work. How would you minister to people? This is what this is about. My intention is not just to open your mind, but this is to show you a different way and how to witness to people. How would you witness to people if with fear and trembling you knew that Jesus had another fold? Would you would would what if you're in the other fold? Uh-oh. Yes. See, you thought when I said another fold, you thought you were in the main fold. That's the problem. You thought you were on the 18. And maybe Jesus has a B team and the B team will come in. But what, hold on, come with this for a second. What if you're the other fold? What if you're not even the main fold? What if you're the other? You, you, you know how they have black, you know how you go over a job, black, white, Asian, Hispanic. Well, they don't put Hispanic. They put uh, Pacific Island. They put all these lists and then they put other and, 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 and nobody really wants to be other. You know, even they have a bubble that says two or more races because you want to feel like you're in one bubble. What if you're the other? <laughs> what if, what if out of good intentions, Jesus knows you know him, but, but, but truthfully, really, you're not following Jesus. You're following people who, who regurgitated, repackaged and remarketed his words. Huh? Oh, you're not willing to go with me there. I just want you to entertain the question. What if you are so, like Paul, like Paul, 
Who was Saul? You're so righteously wrong. Your heart's in the right place. Your heart's in the right place. Your heart's in the right place. But you are wrong as hell. What if? And because of your faith, why does it say that because of faith, it was credited to him as righteousness? You're not even righteous. But because you had the faith to believe God, I'm going to go ahead and credit that to your account. And you thought the earning of faith or the earning meant just that you did uh, uh, good works or moral works. But what if the earning had everything to do with the, the fact that also you you got a good belief system? How many people are going to heaven and your, your belief system is jacked up? We know it's jacked up because look at how you're living on earth. I mean, let's, let's call a thing a thing. <laughs> you know, let's call a thing a thing. I heard somebody once saying, you know, Oprah, on all of that spirituality stuff, she done lost her relationship with God and I ain't got nothing to deal with her. Uh, Oprah, a billionaire who is uh, impacting lives all over the world. Now, I'm not saying just because she's a billionaire and just because she's impacting lives all over the world, then that, that means she knows God. But what I am saying is she knows something that you don't know. So before you're so quick, to castigate people because they don't have the same reasoning that you have. What if you what if what if you're in the other fold? But this is the beauty, Christ is in all. So what am I saying? What am I saying? What am I saying? Because I hear somebody, I hear somebody in my spirit saying, so, so Daryl, you gotta help me with this. Because you you making it seem like being saved doesn't mean anything. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm what I'm trying to get you to understand on a different level is that saved is less about. Come with me for a second. Let me finish my sentence. It's less about what you do and don't do, and more about how you're aware and not aware. Oh, it's manifested in how you do. Because if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. That's what Jesus said. But when we talk about being saved, we're talking about being aware of the finished work. We're talking about being aware of the nature that's already you. We're talking about being aware. 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 I am one with God. I am God on earth. I am God body on earth. I remember the first time somebody asked me, you God body? I said, God body? He said, the way you talk and you speak and you articulate yourself and the things that you say spiritually, I think you're God body. I realized later that's like a sect or they call themselves that or whatever. I don't align myself with all of the things that that group says. But the concept of God body, has it not said that we're all a part of the body of God, the body of Christ? So why would I reject that? Why would I reject that? Because religion had taught me that. Religion had taught me you can come so close to God, but no further. You can come close enough to God, hold on, listen to me, to worship and sing songs and maybe believe a little bit, but not close enough to him to believe you could be like him. And that's exactly what I'm trying to tell you Jesus came to break. That thinking. When the veil was rent from top to, from top to, from top to bottom, from top to bottom, the veil being rent wasn't just that now there's a reconciliation so God loves mankind. He always loved mankind. And so that way the veil on the eyes of the unbeliever has been rent to see that you've always been one with God. You've always been one. The work is finished. The deed is done. So, we, so the work, the labor as it were, is to enter into his rest. So Christ in you, the hope of glory. Christ in you, the hope of glory. Christ in you, the hope of glory. I'm coming to a close. I'm, I'm really coming to a close. But I need to, I need to, I need to, I just need to bring this in for a landing. Because we'll pick this up later. Christ in you, the hope of glory. Christ in you, the hope of glory. So what did we cover today? Jesus' last name was not Christ. That was his nature. And that's your nature. Greater works than Jesus you'll do because the only way you could do the works is through the power that was in you, that's in you, that was in Jesus. Okay, let's look at it a different way. Let's, let's look at it a different way. Let's go to Romans. Um, 
Actually, we might need to go to Ephesians first. Let's go to Ephesians 3. Let's go to Ephesians 3. Ephesians 3. This isn't where I want to be. This is somewhere else. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna bring you there later. Um, I want to go to. Give me a second. Oh, sorry. We are in Ephesians. I'm, I'm, I'm looking at my notes the wrong way. <clears throat> um, uh, let's go to Ephesians chapter 1. We're in verse 18. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that ye may know what is the hope of his calling and the riches of his glory, of his inheritance in the saints, and what is the exceeding greatness of his power to usward who believe according to the working of the mighty power, of his mighty power, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and sat him at his own right hand in heavenly places. It's the same power. It's not a different power. Hear ye, O Israel, the Lord our God is one God. So the same power that was there that worked in Christ, notice that that worked in Christ has to work in you because Christ is in you. Don't you get that? I'm going to I'm going to about I'm going to I'm going to go somewhere. I'm going to go somewhere. I'm going to go somewhere that I've never gone on camera before, but I'm going to go somewhere. When the scripture tells us that the lamb was slain before the foundations of the world, Actually, I'm gonna hold it. No, nope, I'm gonna hold it. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm, I promise I'm not doing this to like teaser or anything. I'm gonna hold that because that's gonna take us somewhere else. We're gonna hold that though. So it's the same power. Let me go back to that. So it's the same power. 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 It's the same Christ. Hear ye, O Israel, the Lord our God is one God. The enemy is scared to death of you discovering your Christhood. I think, I need to be careful with this, but I'm gonna say it anyway, because it's on my heart to say. While I absolutely believe that organized religion has probably been the number one most responsible thing for helping people to come into a consciousness of Christ, I also think, just like you know, fair reaction is an opposite and equal reaction and the other side of the coin. I also think it has been the most reached. It has also done the most damage in getting people to understand their Christhood. Because every great lie has some truth. I'm not saying religion is a great lie. I'm not saying that, but there are those who are twisted. So, so the, the truth in it is that Jesus is the perfect outpicturing of the Father. He was so conscious of his Christhood. I know I'm saying it differently than people say it, but he was so conscious of his Christhood that he was, he, he, and he literally embodied the Christ. So that's the truth. But then it gets wrapped into this hero worship kind of. So you miss the fact that year gods, Christ is in you. You are destined to do greater works than he. You miss all that because you stopped at hero worship. And that's the great tra tragedy. Just imagine for a second. Just for a second. 
Imagine if uh, let's let's let me give the story like this. I've never told it this way, but I want to tell it like this. Let's see how this works. <clears throat> Imagine that you were a uh, basketball instructor. And um, you were brought in because everybody, you know, people knew you, people saw things. You were brought in, you were, you were hired to teach a group of like 30 people. And they're all tall like you, young, you know, prime of life. And you go there to instruct them. And you spend years with them, teaching them everything you can about basketball. Showing them every way to, do the, to be the best that they can. And you were so good at it that people went from just admiring you to sort of just like loving to watch you and talking about how great you are, but forgetting the fact that you came to instruct them that they could play basketball just as well, but because they got so caught up in talking about how great you are and amazing you are and spectacular you are and wonderful you are and tall you are and all these other things and you're this, and they're the same things, that it frustrated you because the purpose was not just to play basketball games and to be told how great and wonderful you are. You know that about yourself. The purpose was so that way you could raise up a generation that would also play basketball at a high level. How frustrated would you be? Now, that's, that's a bad analogy, really, because you're talking about basketball. You're not talking about the savior of the world. And you're not talking about the fact that he emptied himself from heaven. You did it, too, when you came to earth. But I don't want to touch that right now. And came here to be the perfect out pitcher. Went through everything you went through. And the best you did was build a church. <laughs> Sing a song. And he said, I came to show you. You could do this. Peter caught it. I'm telling you, Peter knew what was up. Why do you think Peter, why do you think Jesus said, I'm going to build my church. I'm calling you to rock and I'm going to build my church on you. Why? Because Peter was the only one that said, if you out on the water, bring me out there. He understood what was up. He understood what was up. Yeah, I know that there's something special about you and you're amazing and spectacular and you're Jesus and yeah, but I believe that if you're able to do it, I could do it too. Jesus, Peter, excuse me, understood the assignment. We're all supposed to be reflections of God. Okay, if it makes you sound better, it makes you feel better so you don't feel like you're saying anything untoward, Okay, call yourself a little Christ with a little C, but you're supposed to be like him. That's the whole point. But somehow it just turned into singing songs and dancing. And I'm not against any of those things. The only thing I'm trying to get you to understand is you have got to come to an understanding at some point of who you are. The enemy is not scared of you worshiping Jesus. The enemy is scared of you becoming like him. The enemy is not scared of you being in awe of Jesus. The enemy is scared that you're going to come so much in awe of him that you're going to start to think that you can do the same thing. That's what he's scared about. He's scared to death of you healing the sick. Of you raising the dead. I'm telling you, that's what he's scared of. He's scared to death of you speaking the storms and speaking the winds and speaking to problems and speaking to issues. If you notice, when I posted what I posted earlier, when I shared the word and I shared the word and I had the song playing in the background, Victory Belongs to Jesus, I was talking about how victory came through God, but it's come to you as well. Right. Because I'm trying to get you to understand I'm doing this in different ways, in different places, because I'm trying to get you to understand what Christ has taught you the whole time. You were born to win like Jesus. Jesus has understood the assignment.
What if I told you <laughs> there's nothing that Jesus can do that you are not authorized to do? Huh? Huh? How would you receive that? Would that offend your sensibilities? And my question to you would be why? Do you think that makes Jesus lower or makes you higher? And what are you afraid of? Okay, people. Um, when we pick up later, I'm going to bring us, you got to give me a second, but I'm going to bring us to another part of the word and I'm going to bring you to your Christ nature on another level. I'm going to keep, I'm, 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 I'm unraveling this, you know, how the, the scripture calls it the manifold witness of God, wisdom of God, manifold, it's folds in it, it's folds in it. And I'm unlayering for you who you are. Let me pray a prayer with you as we close tonight. I want to pray a prayer with you. The prayer, if it had a title, would be, show me who I am. I've been praying this for at least two years now. Show me who I am. Not who I thought I was. Not who people told me I had to be. Not with the world. Not with society, not with the culture, not with religion, not with uh, the folks in the schoolyard said, no, I want to know who I really am. I don't want to leave this life having only witnessed a shadow. I want to know who I really am. If I'm meant to walk in the power of Christ, I, I want to walk in the power of Christ. If I'm meant to raise the dead, I want to raise the dead. I want to know, see, this is what I learned about me. And for better or worse, and it's gotten me in trouble at parts and places in my life, but I'm going to say this. I am one of those people that I don't, I, I want to, I want to be in the mix. I do. I want to be in the mix. When I was at school, I used to sit up front all the time. I'm in your face. Yeah. When I go to an event, I want to be up in front. I've gone with people to events. They, like, they want to sit toward the back. All right, bro, I'll see you later. I didn't come here to sit in the back. I want to be in the middle. I want to be a part of it. I want to be a part of it. I want to be a part of it. Time out for talking about what God did. I want to know about what he's doing. And if we are promised this, I mean, if we're promised it, then I want to be a part of it. Before I pray, let me give you a preview. I'm going to be bringing you into some teachings about the kingdom. You've heard about church and church is a wonderful thing, but church has members. Kingdoms don't have members. <laughs> Kingdoms have citizens. Members don't have rights. Citizens have rights. We're going to be talking about birth rights. Yeah. You, you have a birthright. We're talking about inheritances. You see, Church is a beautiful thing, but you don't get an inheritance in a church. You get an inheritance in a kingdom. We're going to be talking about the economy of God. We're going to be talking about your kingdom assignment. You have a kingdom assignment. You have a kingdom assignment. Just let me be clear on that. You have a kingdom assignment. I'm not talking about your job. I'm not talking about your career. I'm not talking about what you're doing to get money right now. I'm talking about your kingdom assignment. We're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about your position in the kingdom of heaven and what you're supposed to be doing. And we're going to talk about the kingdom of God in you. You're going to love this. I'm telling you, you're going to love it. If you love the word of God, you're going to love what I have to share with you. And let me just say this. If you want me to come to your church, your ministry, your your institution and share this, then DM me. Part of the reason I'm, I'm reaching out and saying this here on social media is because I want you to know what it is. 
I don't think I would go to a, uh, I've already kind of thought about this and prayed on this. I wouldn't go to a church and unravel this for the first time. I just don't think that that's right. Not unless I really felt like the, the, the set man of God or woman of God of that house gave me the permission. Because I don't want to seem like I'm, I'm, sometimes you can come so different, even though it's the word, you can come so different that it can, it can turn people off. And that's not my goal. So I'm, 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 I'm putting out bits and pieces here. I'm putting out bits and pieces here and I'm leaving, I'm leaving breadcrumbs like Hansel and Gretel did in the Schwartz forest. Okay. So that way they, you can, you can make your way back. But don't you want to go higher in the kingdom? I mean, for real. <laughs> don't you want to, don't you want to go higher? All right. Let me pray with you. Holy God, I, I share with the people what I believe you put on my heart to share. Thank you for letting me be a vessel today. Thank you for letting me see another day. Thank you for giving me the voice to speak. Thank you for giving me the mind to comprehend. Thank you for giving me the, 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 the wisdom, the revelation, the ability to be able to do it. Thank you for protecting me so that way I could give this word. Thank you, Lord, for the hearers of the word that they will be doers. Thank you, Lord, that what I said, they will, you, they will begin to think on and it will take root in their hearts. Thank you, Lord, that you are unveiling to the world a new understanding of the mystery that has been among the Gentiles since the beginning of time, that it is Christ in you, Christ in you, Christ in us, Christ in me, Christ in them, the hope of glory. Show us who we really are. Help us to unlearn all of the things that we learn throughout life and only made us worse. Let us have the humility to say, I believed it strongly, but I was wrong. Let us have the humility and the, the release the judgment of ourselves about it. When we know better, we do better. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. I'm gonna leave you with the words of Mark Twain. He said, it's not what we don't know that hurts us. It's what we believe to be true that just ain't so. Think about that. It's not what we don't know that hurts us. It's what we believe to be true that just ain't so. I love you. Stay